God's Boy and Science. First, I'm going to give some background because otherwise the story doesn't make too much sense or it sounds like I'm just pulling it out of thin air. Um, the, um, the background will begin with a lecture that I heard from Dennis Pardee at the University of Chicago um, when I was taking Hebrew there. And we were going through all kinds of strange forms. Um, there, in Hebrew, there are several tenses. There's the call, which is the simple form, the kind of the standard form. There's the PL, which is doing something uh, with emphasis. Um, there is the hifial, which is, you know, there's a kind of a, a ayan in there. And um, the hifial is, has to do with causative, which is a strange form for us because we don't you have that form in English. But the force is that if, for example, um, you would have somebody, you could say, he sat up, then the hifial of the same verb would be, he caused him to sit up. Um, if it is to go over some water, ever, um, uh, let's see, avar, um, then it would be, he caused him to go over water. And, uh, and typically, it tries to put two I uh, vowels in between and put an H in front. Um, and that's why it, the, the uh, uh, Baal turns into hif il. Um, now, in Hebrew, many words are regular, which means that all the consonants do what you kind of expect them to do. But there are some consonants that are irregular, and one of them is yod in the middle. And if you have yod in the middle and the hey at the end, it's even more irregular. So that yod, in this case, will turn to wow in the imperfect. And uh, the imperfect will have a leading patah in, in there, an ah sound. And it will have a final segol, eh sound. And so the verb haya, well, actually, this wasn't in the lesson. This I started thinking while the lesson was going on. The verb haya happens to have this, uh, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. That's hawa. That's haya. It, that should be a yod. Haya. Huh. I didn't do that. I missed it. Anyway, um, the verb haya uh, actually turns into ya, ya, we. Hmm. Have you ever heard that term before? Well, after class, I went up and I said, did you realize that what you just did will perfectly explain the name of God? And he, and Dennis Pardee said, well, yeah, nobody really believes that. And I said, but isn't that the correct form. And he beat around the bush for a little bit and finally said, no, you're right. That is the correct form. So, which was odd because I would think the right way if you're not embarrassed by this kind of thing is to simply say, no, you're right, but there are a number of problems with making that uh, 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 connection and so therefore most scholars don't believe it. Now, that would be the easy way to say it. But it was almost like he didn't want to concede that one point. But it was true. Well, that would mean that Yahweh 
would be translated, he will cause to be. Which, of course, would be the creator, or because it's the imperfect form, perhaps better translated as the sustainer. It may include creation in the past, but it includes creation in the present and in the future. Now, that's an interesting point. Um, after, after I gave the talk, I talked to Richard Davidson, and he said, well, you know what? That's what Albright said way back when. I go, well, how come nobody says that? So Albright is not a bad scholar. Uh, but it's like nobody wants to say. Well, I'll tell you why, I think, near as I can tell, there's a couple of arguments against it. One of them is the name of God is ineffable. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Nobody knows what it means. It's just there. Well, but it isn't just there there's a precise grammatical form that fits. A uh, number two argument, Exodus 3, 13 through 14, connects the name of God with the call of the verb to be. I think I have this wrong. Um, but you can look it up. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They shall say to me, What is his name? And what do I say to them? Well... God said unto them, I am that I am. Now, eh, yeah, I share, eh, yeah. And he said, thus shall thou say to the, unto the children of Israel, I am, eh, yeah. See, eh, yeah, has sent me to you. And of course, you run into this in the New Testament before Abraham was, I am. Right? But it's more than that. God said, moreover to Moses, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, the Lord. Now, if you look at it in the King James and in a number of other translations, you'll notice that it's in small caps. And the reason why is because it's not really the Lord. That's not Adonai. That's the way it's pronounced. But it's actually those four letters, which as near as we can tell, are pronounced Yahweh. And so, the Lord, Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, so right there in the verses, there's a connection between I am and Yahweh. So, the claim is that it must be part of the verb to be and it must be the same tense of the verb to be. Um, and that Lord, if you were to read the Hebrew itself, it's Yehovah, or if you prefer Jehovah, which you've probably heard before, uh, that's the consonants for Yahweh. And the vowels for Adonai, which is the way it's read in Hebrew, uh, if you're listening to a synagogue reading of the scriptures. Adonai simply means Lord, and that's why it's put Lord, but it's also put in four caps to let you know that it's not just the Adonai, it's actually that four-letter combination, or as the Greek would put it, the tetragrammaton. Now, there is a primitive verb, hawa. So maybe that's where it came from. Well, you know, it's interesting because in the scholarly world, nobody wants to put their foot down, and there's a reason for that. Because by the standard rules, the call imperfect should be yihwa, or perhaps yihwo, not yahweh. A, e happens to be the the vowel form that is found in the hyphial. So even if you went that way, this is a hyphial form. 
Now, the hephil and the kal have the same root. Haya, he, yod, he. Now, of interest, the name Elia or Elijah is El, God, E, the ending there is my, standard ending, and Yah, which is, of course, Yahweh. So that, that word means my God is Yahweh. And you will notice that there are a lot of uh, words in, uh, um, a lot of names in Hebrew that end in ayah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hezekiah, that's all yeah, meaning Yahweh. It's the shortened form. So this, this, is, a, this is a defiant name if you like, if, if you're talking about, when people are talking about Baal. Okay, now, I'm gonna go over a few texts on Elijah and then so that you can kind of see where I'm drawing this from. Uh, this is the beginning of where Elijah comes into the text in first, uh, that should be First Kings 17.1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to, unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall be not uh, dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. This is really cheeky. But the other thing is that he's swearing by the Lord. He's not claiming that I have the power to do this. And then the next, um, the next chapter I'm going to go over, uh, is to uh, Zarephath. And you'll notice the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to stay in thee. Notice that uh, Elijah is going there at the command of God. He went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks, and she called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water. And then uh, as he was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Oh, make me a little food too. Um, and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth. So she already knew the Lord somehow. And she knew that Elijah was a prophet of the Lord. Maybe she knew who Elijah was. It's not really totally clear. And she says, you know, I don't have anything. He says, all I've got is a little bit for me and my son, and that's it. Um, and Elijah said to her, don't worry. Just do what, uh, do what you're planning, but uh, make me a little first, and there'll be enough for you. Whoa. Okay. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And... You know, she's, she's in a country that worships Baal. But somehow, she had gotten the idea that the Lord was more powerful than Baal, even in her country. And so, with Elijah swearing by the Lord, she um, goes ahead and says, uh, yep, okay, I'll do that. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Uh, it's just interesting to see that, that picture and to see the, the fact that the religion stands out in it. And then a little later, we come to the passage when, uh, uh, when Elijah is showing himself to um, to Obadiah, and it says, uh, Obadiah says to a a Elijah, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Now, uh, didn't you know that? Well, 
Now, it's not clear whether Elijah actually knew that or not. But what can be said, uh, I'm going to draw your attention not so much to what Obadiah was doing, but I'm going to draw your attention to what Jezebel is doing. Now, it's doubtful that Jezebel herself walked out and did that. In all probability, she had devoted followers. And they were probably the priests because, you know, in the Adventist church, the ministers kind of separate out from everything else. Well, in those days, the priests would often fight the battles along with everybody else. And they were the more committed soldiers, so to speak. So it appears that these priests were actually killing anybody who would not kiss Baal and would not worship him. A little later in the passage, we find uh, that uh, Elijah is mocking the, um, uh, the priest of Baal, and he says, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or is he in a journey, or per peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Now, that sounds mean. And I guess it is in one sense. But he was actually following their theology. Baal went to sleep. He went to the underworld for six months out of the year. He just hadn't got back yet. By the way, another name for Baal was Hadad. I should be precise, actually. It isn't Baal. It's Baal. And in fact, I was stunned to find that there's a video game that had Baal as one of its uh, villains. Uh, and they pronounced it that way. <laughs> uh, there's actually three consonants, uh, a B, Beth, and a lion, which we don't use, and then uh, the L, or Lamed. Anyway, so, so this is actually fits the context very well. Um, and then a little further, I want to draw your attention to when Elijah prays himself. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So this is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Among other things, this is the hottest part of the day, or just finishing the hottest part of the day, which they had already had. And now it's just starting to get a little tiny bit cooler. Um, that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor the any that regarded. And Elijah said to all the people, come near me. And the people came near to, unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, which is a politically incorrect thing to do. You see, the 10 tribes of the north would be 10 stones. He is making an argument that Israel and Judah belong together. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came. I forgot that that's, that should be the Lord capitalized. I missed that somehow. Uh, saying, uh, Israel shall be thy name. <coughs> Excuse me. And Boy, that was loud. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, and I want you to notice his prayer very carefully because he says something that's not explicitly said elsewhere in the text. But it is explicitly said here. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Elijah didn't go out and do this and expect God to cover him. Elijah was doing this at the direction of God. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. It's not about Elijah, it's about Elijah's God. A little far, further on, uh, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, is the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. In other words, you killed all the prophets of Baal, 
I'm going to do the same to you. You've got 24 hours to live. And so Elijah, instead of standing up and saying, listen, God is going to protect me, he took off. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, out past where even the Judah, Judites could have protected him, out where he'd be alone. And came and sat down under, under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I want you to note the complaint. I am not better than my father's. What does that say about his father's? It says that they weren't worthy of living, right? And it says that all of his life he had had a struggle to try to be better than his fathers. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, as we know, he was wrong. But I want you to know how he felt inside. It looked like to him that there was nobody else that was really faithful. A little further on, um, 2 Kings 1, 5, this is the story of um, Ahaziah who is uh, sending messengers unto um, Ekron to find out if he's going to be healed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said to them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man to meet us and said to us, Go then again to the king that sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord. Is it not because there is not a God in Israel? You don't have a God and you can't inquire of him. And you, you really do. That thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. By the way, Beelzebub is a bad, uh, well, it's, it's actually what's in the Bible. And it's making mockery. Uh, it's uh, Beelzebul is tough lord. Our exalted lord. Beelzebub is lord of the flies which you may remember as a title for a novel at one time. That's where they got it from. Um, the God of Ekron. Therefore, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said to them, What, what kind of man was he that uh, came to meet you and told you these words? What, what did he look like? He said, Well, he was a hairy man. And girt with a leather, uh, a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, I know that guy. That's Elijah the Tishbite. He had a characteristic dress that anybody who knew uh, knew who it was. Well, and he and a little farther later, this is Elisha following Elijah. Elijah's mantle fell from him. That was his characteristic dress, right? And Elisha took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah, Elisha went over. And a uh, little further on down, you find out that Elijah's poor man's garb turned into the uniform. You know, it's kind of like back in my day when people, a uh, few people started wearing jeans and a t-shirt to show that they weren't really trying to dress up. Pretty soon, 
everybody was wearing jeans and a t-shirt as if it was a uniform. So Zephaniah 13.4, talking about prophets, uh, prophets that are not going to prophesy anymore. He says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision which he has prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. And see, you put on the prophet's uniform and then you go out and preach and everybody's supposed to be impressed because you're a man of God because you're wearing the right stuff. Well, what is the right stuff? It doesn't really say. It says rough garment. Apparently hairy. But that's about as far as you get. Well, Actually, we have some idea because, behold, in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, the last verses of the Old Testament, by the way, in English, and the last verses to be written in the Old Testament um, in Hebrew, and the last verses of the prophets in Hebrew. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Notice his job. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So, we come to the New Testament and we run into John. And it's recorded both in Matthew and in Mark and it says basically the same thing. I'll read the Matthean version, but... At the, and the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. John dressed like a prophet. Here we have specified what kind of hair, camel's hair. Now, was John uh, Elijah? Well, According to John 1.19, he claimed not to be, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And they conf he confessed, and he didn't deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, Well then, are you Elijah? Elia. And he said, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? And he said, answered, No. And, of course, he goes on to say, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Um, but it's not that simple, because in Luke 1.17, the angel is telling Zechariah what his son, who will become John, of course, uh, will do. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And, in fact, in Matthew, it's done explicitly and by Jesus himself. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. No, he's not Elijah exactly, but... He is fulfilling the Elijah prophecy. And he was dressed for the part. Now, I want to take you back in your imagination to a poor boy who's growing up across the river. How do we know he's poor? Because he had only one set of clothes. And they were made out of the worst material, rough camel's hair. Camels were unclean. So this is a boy who is not wearing fancy threads. Camel's hair, piece of leather around his waist, that was it. The reason I want you to picture that is because sometimes we take the later picture of, oh, this is prophetic garb. No, it wasn't prophetic garb. It was the cheapest stuff. This kid got his clothes at Goodwill. That's the meaning of that. Now, this kid's family wasn't anything to be proud of. We don't know for sure what it is. It probably had something to do with they didn't stand up for God. 
And somehow, like alcoholic parents uh, sometimes have kids that won't touch a drop and are vehemently against alcohol because they've seen what is done. Apparently, this kid reacted against what his parent, his father and grandfather at least, and probably up beyond that, what his ancestors were doing. And his reaction was to follow the creator God, the sustainer God, even further. Well, he's a prophet, so apparently he went to the schools of the prophets. And when he got there, he was disgusted by what he saw. Most of the people, they were in it for the money. They didn't really believe. They didn't really act that way. It's, ugh. There were a few good ones, but you know what happened? A little ways into seminary training, um, Soldiers came around and brought an image of Baal. And the corrupt ones, oh, sure, Baal's, uh, Baal and El, Baal is El's son. We worship El. We can worship Baal. The people who stood up got killed. There's nobody left. And the place where you expect the worship of Yahweh. Now a little more about that. Remember that Yahweh is the sustainer. Among other things, he sustains the devil, which is absolute proof that God is not an absolute tyrant because if he did, if he was, the devil wouldn't exist. But They're going from worshiping the sustainer to worshiping the boss. That's what Baal meant. The Lord, the person in charge, power. Interestingly, the word was also used sometimes for husband, which has interesting implications. Um, it doesn't say for sure, but the strong implication is that this man spent a lot of time in communion with God and spent a lot of time listening to God. And he learned to recognize the voice of God as different from his own impressions. He learned to recognize it and trust it implicitly. So that when God said, something is wrong here. So that when God said, go to uh, the king and say it's not going to rain until I say so. He said, okay, God, you sure? Well, then I'll be there. And he walked in. Knowing that, the natural reaction would be for the king to say, how dare you do that to me? And of course, that was the king's reaction, but apparently he was so stunned when it first happened that he couldn't believe his eyes, and he didn't command anybody to go get this guy until after he had left the palace. But they did go and get him, or try. And God said, you know that little place out there where you used to play? The, where the river kind of comes around the bend? And it looks like you can see everything, but you really can't. I want you to hide there, and you can drink out of the brook, and I'll take care of the food. Yeah, it says God told him that. So he did. 
And then it says, God said to him, Brook's dry, you need water, but I know where I can send you, and I'll take care of the food. And so he went up to the middle of Baal worship territory. I don't know what happened to this poor widow. Maybe, maybe her husband was dead because he was a good man. And she, but somehow she had gotten enough disillusioned with Baal worship and knew enough that when Elijah walked in, she knew he worshipped the Lord. The sustainer, I should say. Because that's what it really means. It's not the Lord. This isn't a duel between two powerful people seeing who's strongest. This is a duel between power and support. And so he goes up there and she recognizes him and she says, okay, I trust you. She trusted him with the last little bit of food she had and God rewarded that trust for him and her and their boy who was later raised to life. Interestingly enough, Elijah, Elijah doesn't seem to have known that the boy would be raised to life. If you read the record, she said, what did you do to me? And he said to God, why are you doing this to us? To her, yeah, this isn't fair. And God said, don't worry, I got it covered. After this, God at the right time said to him, okay, now it's time for you to go to Israel. And so he went to Mount Carmel and called all the people together. If you like, this was an experiment. It had a treatment bowl and a control bowl. Or maybe I should say two different treatments. It has prediction because Elijah predicted the, uh, the outcome. Everybody knew what Elijah's prediction was and everybody knew what the prophets of Baal's prediction was. It's fascinating to me um, that this prediction came with a death sentence if you were wrong. Don't worry. If the regular bull had caught fire, Elijah would have been toast, possibly even literally. And it interacts, it takes religion in its interaction with what many people call the real world. This physical reality interacts with religion. Now, that suggests that religious experience can sometimes have some of the same attributes that science has. But if science is defined as applied naturalism, then Elijah's experiment is totally incompatible with science. So we again have two definitions of science. Are we talking about fit with theory? Are we talking about reproducible? Or are we talking about naturalism? And by the way, the fact that this is clearly unnatural is one of the reasons why virtually all non-conservative biblical scholars reject the story. Because you just can't have miracles, and miracle is so central to this point. Now, this has even more significance for us today because remember Malachi 4, 5, the prophecy, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, now you could say that, yes, John the Baptist fulfilled the role of Elijah 
right down to the dress. But also, I want you to notice that this is the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which implies that there's still another Elijah to come. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Why do the fathers not like the children? Partly because of divorce. It's interesting that in Malachi, he says, I hate divorce. You get rid of the woman that you lived with. It's the guys that do it on the average anyway. The women are left out in the cold with the children. Elijah's message is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And if the hearts of the fathers are turned to the children, if they become followers of the sustaining God and they sustain their children, the hearts of the children will naturally turn towards the fathers. Now, of course, that was Elijah, and, you know, he was just uh, an unbelievable guy. He had, he had all this talking with God that we can't have. Well, James would disagree with you. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. No, he's just like you and me. In fact, he started at the bottom of the barrel, remember? He was poor. His parents weren't anything to be proud of. And yet God used him. And my prayer today is that God will use us in the same way. Comment in the back. But you know that most of the textbooks talk about a time when the pronunciation of Hebrew was forgotten and the Masoretes added the punctuation to give us the sounds. Do you, are you bothered by <laughs> by this a, recreation? A little, a little bit. I'm not as bothered as it might be, and I'll tell you why. Um, there are places where Hebrew has been transliterated, or more precisely, what it sounded like has been written down. And the Greek is iota, alpha, Omicron, Upsilon, Epsilon, Yahweh, or sometimes Yoda, Alpha, Beta, Epsilon, Yabe, or probably by that time the Be was started to be softened as it is in modern Greek, so it's Yabe. So you can find those two trans translations even uh, th really, there are very few scholars who would argue that it's different from that. We do have vowels in Greek, and they did come through. And the pronunciation has mm -hmm. been at least partially preserved. Now, you, you know, you have to hasten to add that it's not exact. Is it ah or ah? It's hard to say. Because the Greeks didn't make that distinction in their alpha. Mm -hmm. It could be ah or it could be ah. But one of those two it should be. And so even if you want to say it was ineffable, I think the ineffable comes from the fact that by the time people were doing this kind of thing, um, native Hebrew had been partly lo lost, and the reason they put the markings in is to try to resurrect the old sounds. 
<coughs> but we do have evidence from before. The Septuagint is ex extremely useful in this regard. Uh, when we get into the, the question of the rejection of this uh, story by scholars, um, it seems to me that the question needs to be asked, what are they saying about God? What kind of God are they envisioning? Uh, they need to define it uh, different than, than the God in the Bible. Are they saying God is not capable of doing this? Well, or are, yeah. they, are they saying God does not exist, exist even? I don't know that I can say they followed Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher may have followed the contemporaries as well. From what I can gather, it's kind of a, uh, it, it fit all over there. But uh, Schleiermacher's God didn't intervene in nature. So how can you explain nature without God? Who, uh, nature is too complex to explain without God. Well, the argument of that complexity um, hadn't been developed to the point it is now. And so people back then mm -hmm. could say, well, maybe life could arise spontaneously. In fact, remember that until Pasteur made his findings, a lot of people believed in spontaneous generation for microbes. Mm -hmm. And before Reedy mm -hmm. did his mm -hmm. work, a lot of people believed in spontaneous generation for flies and things like that. And so what happened was that there was a point where the origin of life wasn't perceived to be that much of a problem. Yeah. And so people said, well, we don't need God. But as time goes on, it's gotten worse. And, you know, the, the, the simple uh, solutions of yesteryear don't fit anymore. And by the way, some of the simple arguments of yesteryear don't fit anymore. Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch because uh, writing wasn't invented then. Now we know not only that alphabetic uh, that writing was invented then, but alphabetic writing was invented by then. Uh, in fact, it's entirely possible, mm -hmm. depending on what you do with certain parts of history, that Moses invented the mm -hmm. alphabets for the main purpose of writing down the stories mm -hmm. that the Hebrews needed to remember. Well, it, it seems to me that uh, theologians need to define God more carefully. Well, theologians, I don't think, need to define God. I think they need to recognize God. Um, Revelation 13 speaks about fire coming down from heaven in the sight of men. Here we have a story about fire coming down from heaven in the sight of men. Do you see a connection there? Oh, yes. Yes. And what it says is that miracle does not prove that you're on the right side. Uh, all it proves is that naturalism is wrong. Of course, that's a huge thing to prove in this day and age, but, uh, but it isn't the end of the, the story. In fact, as I will argue later on, Miracle doesn't even prove that your theology is correct. What it proves is that you're walking closely enough to God to where he can, he can uh, reward you safely without uh, having you, uh, and it doesn't even prove that completely. It's the other side that does miracles too. Well, but no, but the point of it is that there's, there are people for whom God does miracles, but their theology isn't completely correct. Um, so miracles prove very little theologically. Um, I think in this case they kind of prove that Baal isn't uh, the top god. So do do you see any other connection? I mean, like a you know biblical connection. It seems like it's asking us to make a connection between those two stories, Revelation 13 and Mount Carmel. Well, there is a connection, but it, it goes mm -hmm. through several stages, okay? One of which is, remember, people started faking prophets. They put on the clothes, and they, they had a vision, but the vision was their own. 
Mm -hmm. um, it goes down to James and John who say, you know, these people, they didn't let us have any food. You know, we, we walked in and they wouldn't serve us because we're the wrong kind of people. Uh, I don't, that, we've, we've never had that problem today, but. <laughs> um, and, and so, um, uh, and, and so they said, well, should we call down fire from heaven on them? And Jesus says to them, you don't know what kind of spirit you're talking about. You don't know the spirit you are. The Son of Man came to save and not to destroy. And so calling fire down from heaven is, um, I think it was something at the beginning to establish that God actually ran the place and was used primarily against people who were interested in not just not feeding you, but in killing you. And in fact, calling down fire from heaven on an altar was to show that God was more powerful than the storm god who was supposed to have lightning under his control. Yes, yes, it does kind of remind you of uh, modern army warfare where, where the guy will radio in at uh, GPS so-and-so, there's an enemy, can you send a few bombs that way? Wait about five minutes, and they're gone. Hell, hellfire missile. That's LS. calling fire down from heaven, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, have you heard anything about, um, I'm not even sure if I know the term, but sacred name or names? Theology, where we're supposed to pronounce the name of Yahweh or and not like the English form? Uh, there's two theologies, one of them which is that name has tremendous power and if you pronounce it, why suddenly all your wishes will be granted. Open says me. Um, <coughs> there's another form that you don't, you don't ever say the name because you might use it in a wrong request. And so don't, don't even go there. Which, of course, contributed to the loss of the precise pronunciation, or at least the knowledge of the precise pronunciation. And then there's a Jehovah's and then there's you must call where you must call him Jehovah, which is interesting because it's actually a mix. Jehovah. But I, I think it's not so much the name itself as it is what it stands for. This is the sustainer God, including the creator God. Uh, creator, sustainer together. This is the God who supports everything. This is a God who if, if he were to turn off his support, we would all just go poof. That'd be the end. The God who sustains even the people who don't like him. God sends the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and he sends the rain on the good and the evil. That's the kind of God we serve. And it's entirely different from the God who is dominating and who you will bow to. And guess what? Since I serve that God, I get to help him make you bow. We have some simplistic thinking. God is going to do everything good. Everything bad comes from the devil. I watch the people being drowned in the Mediterranean. Think of the horror of that. We can say, well, the devil's doing it. And I want to say, why doesn't God prevent it? And I know the whole argument behind that, but we must look at millennia of suffering and death to innocent people and guilty people alike with no distinction. And we ask, I ask, where is God? 
Why isn't he acting to preserve well, the innocent? Well, God takes responsibility for that in an active way, no less. Recall the beginning of the book of Job. God says, this guy, he's my man. You can't make him not be. I never liked that story. And then uh, we have to live with it whether we like it or not. And then God says to, uh, the devil says, will you touch him and he'll turn against you. And so God says, well, he's in your power. So was it God or was it the devil that did those things to Job? Well, we get to find out in the second round where God says, by the way, since you've been down on earth, what do you think of Job? He's remained his faithfulness even though you moved me to destroy him. God was cooperating with the devil's program. And he, and he took full responsibility for it. For how long? What's the time element? Well, yes, uh, at a certain point uh, when God and Job had had a little discussion and God had said, you know, you don't even understand what's going on. And then God, uh, Job had repented and then God, uh, God said, you think Job's bad. These three friends, they're way worse. These are the friends who were saying, God always rewards the good, and he always punishes the evil. So if you're being punished, then you must be evil, right? Come on, Job, what'd you do? Confess it. God will forgive, and everything will be okay. And, and God says, that's an even worse picture. So, Job, you pray for those guys. Isn't and, the great and God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. But isn't the matter settled today? Uh, isn't it clear to the universe what went on, who was at fault? Why are we lingering here? Because I don't think it's totally clear. I think there are parts of it that are totally clear, but there are some other parts that still aren't clear. And one of them is, well, that was Jesus. He was God. He could do those things. He could be perfect. What about all those uh, people? You can't make them perfect in mass, can you? And I think that one of the things that's going to be demonstrated is, yes, he can. Now, they won't make themselves perfect. God will. But one of the things he's going to demonstrate just like he demonstrated with Job, it doesn't matter what you do to these people, they will stay with me. And I think the second thing that he's going to demonstrate is it doesn't matter what you do to the other people, you can do anything you want to them, they're not going to repent. The fifth plague, uh, the, is it the fourth plague? It's the darkness on the seat of the beast and men nod their tongues for pain and for their sores, which are still going on, and they cursed the God of heaven. Doesn't matter what you do, you can't reach these people. Yes, eventually every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but there'll be a lot of people who say, if that's the way heaven is, I don't want it. If our job is not to get to the top, if our job is not to dominate, if our job is not to become imitators of the Lord, the master, the boss, but our, God, our, our job is to become sharers of the love of the sustainer. Some people won't want to live in a, a universe like that. And God's not going to make them. Beautiful, Paul.
Thank you. Your presentation today dovetails into what the teacher spoke this morning. To me, it was one of the best things I had to share. Uh, Colossians is open. Uh, for us to really truly have a true picture of Jesus Christ, who he is, to live the life. We just we have a message and we've got to know that ourselves. So to spend time with the Lord, know him, realize and knew the Lord. For us to do that, you know, uh, we were talking about the Lord using a gentleman who was, uh, uh, you might have heard the same uh, radio, Dan Beck, for example, interviewed the gentleman. He knew nothing about seven languages. He called and he found out that yes, the gentleman was and is a fundamental Christian believer in the word. And that um, then he found out this is a that is a great that said, I never knew about him that. What do you hope to do? He called us the John Conference and talked to the Vice President of Food. And you know, the Lord is going to use common people, ordinary people, who are really truly rooted and grounded in Christ. Yes. Yeah. He's going to make himself known black and white. I think the time has come where the issues are going to be made black and white. And he's going to use ordinary people. Yeah. All over the world. Yeah. All over the world. Yeah. And our job is to become so acquainted with God that when God speaks, we hear the voice, we recognize that it's God, and we're willing to follow it. At the risk of death if necessary. And that takes some experience. So get your experience now. 